uh, the, the, the theoreticians ought to be really looking at this theoretical problem and the ob observers ought to be gathering much more data of the sort that we get. But I think they're all a little scared because it's an unpopular subject. Uh, they're, they're worried about their jobs and, and they're worried about getting uh, um, getting moving on up the ladder, you know, if they're, if they're postdocs. A young person uh, in academia cannot afford to go against the Big Bang. Uh, he'd immediately mm. lose, lose his position, mm. um, tenure. <laughs> Tenure, tenure, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> said last night. And so there is this difficulty. You can't expect them to do that. Don't collaborate with, uh, with Chipar or don't collaborate with Joffrey because if you, if you do that, you will have problems to get a position in such a place. I, I, I received some, such a black mail. When I was a student, I was naive. And when, when I saw the chance to, to work with Chipar, he sent me a letter. This is 30 years ago, in fact, good heavens, I hate to even think that it's 30 years ago. And uh, warning me now that you may find some people put off by an association with me. And I, I didn't, really, I didn't even understand what he was talking about. I thought, I'm just trying, you know, we're just looking for the truth, aren't we? Um, we're just investigating other areas, alternatives. But I found, indeed, that it was not this way and that there was a great deal of hostility. In my opinion, even, even if we are wrong, I'm not saying that we are, we are right or anybody is right. From an observational point of view, we have a very peculiar object. So, and this peculiar object it deserves some further research. This is what, what we need. And the interpretations are, are free and are, are to be discussed. Now we're entering the realm of cosmology, and it is here that religion, philosophy, metaphysics, and science all meet. And make no mistake about it, they all play a role in, in, our, in our beliefs. The, the amount of data that we actually have to support any particular model is, is small. It's mostly consistency arguments. We can argue that the three degree microwave background radiation, yes, it can be explained within a Big Bang context, but I believe Fred Hoyle and Jan Harlikar and Jack Burbage have, have suggested an alternate explanation. And I'm sure we could find 10 more if the need were felt. But strangely enough, it's not. You don't get tenure in a university, you don't get promoted, you don't get recognition by looking too much into unpopular areas. Cosmology is, is not a science. It's, it's a, it has a lot of scientific aspects. We, we can know many things with the science. We can know how the galaxies are distributed. And this is our measure with the, with the observations. We can know uh, how, is, how rich are the, the metal, how many metals are in the intergalactic medium or in some galaxy, and, and all these aspects are scientific. But uh, uh, with regard to some considerations uh, uh, about the beginning of the universe, this is a, in, some way, in some way crossing the barrier of the science and going to, the, to something in between the science and metaphysical speculation. Sociology is very important in science. People are in groups and gangs and cliques and clusters, and of course that enforces conformity. You want to be one of the boys, one of the, one of the dare I say, one of the girls. It's the same, after all. Um, and so you, you tend to think alike. The longer you're together, the more you will think alike. I remember one famous group once, um, I asked them, how do you resolve uh, disagreements amongst yourselves? And the reply was, we vote. And I thought, what a strange thing to do in science. Vote? I would think the best thing is that all seven of you disagree. But there's a feeling that that creates chaos. And the argument that we need some common thread or road to follow, for the majority to follow, um, in order to have some kind of of organization to the whole scientific enterprise, there is an argument for that. But when it becomes all-encompassing, so that no other possibilities can even be explored, that is not good. And we're there. Scientific notions take on, they have a, a lifetime of the, that, that really is involved in the, it gets involved with like somebody's job. It gets involved with, you know, my theories are all in this particular, you know, support this area, 
And so I don't want anybody in my department, actually, who doesn't work in that. I wouldn't want somebody in my department who is working in a very different side of things, like the steady state, big banger kind of thing. If you are a steady state person, you're, at, these, at this point, you're feeling a little bit you know, paranoid anyhow, because most people said, hey, they found, you know, Penzias and uh, whoever he was, Arno Penzias, and the guy found there was a, the, the sky wasn't dark. There was a tiny little bit of light. The cosmology as a science has begun uh, one century ago with Einstein theory. So in 100 years, uh, you cannot uh, produce a theory of everything. This, uh, this is crazy. Even, even from a philosophical point of view, historical point of view, we have begun uh, 100 years ago. In, in 1920, uh, we thought that the Milky Way was the all, uh, all the universe, and now, and now you, you want to, to produce the belief that in 80 years or, or some, and something you have produced the, the theory of all the universe from the beginning to now. This is uh, uh, somewhat uh, incredible, incredible uh, and not uh, very objective. The Big Bang is is predicated on the assumption that from a point of view of physics, there are no surprises in store for us, which is very unlikely. When you start using words like infinity and perpetual and steady state and all those kind of things, you're really using, you're using a vocabulary that was formed here in a quite like limited sort of part of the vastness of, of everything, right? I mean, it, we, we developed that vocabulary as a way of like finding food, mates, you know, building shelters, that sort of stuff. We didn't develop that vocabulary from vast knowledge or need to know about how the universe works. We're at the level of, of where the observations are clear, in my view, but the theory is not. And one of the things that you find in, in science, and particularly in astronomy, is that people find it very hard to believe in observations if they don't have a theory, if they don't have a theory ready to explain it. We also need theoreticians. Observations without any theory don't work. And theory without any observations <laughs> certainly don't work. And the problem is to get them together. The problem is to get them together. We need some glue. To anybody with an open mind, that should really prove the case that uh, that quasars are associated with galaxies that must ordinary kind of redshifts, while the quasars have higher redshifts. Therefore, they must um, part of the redshift must be non-cosmological, not to do with the expansion of the universe. Because I'm always thinking, if we can only be more rigorous, they will believe us. But I was wrong. I was very naive. It's got nothing to do with that. The rolling of the Big Bang, it's, it's largely been determined by the way people seized upon these ideas, and there's been tremendous amount of uh, propaganda making claims that here we see everything happening and this has to be right. The people that are in that field treat it like a religion. And not so very objective. The, the reaction of the orthodox astronomers to this idea is that it, it violates the uh, the Big Bang uh, assumption, the Big Bang hypothesis, and therefore it cannot be true. The amateurs tend to be more broad, more broad-minded than the people who have to earn their keep by being narrow-minded. <laughs> I, I got it.